Ja, ganz schön. So, obwohl ich rede lieber auf, Deutsch, auf Englisch, ich kann Ihre Frage auch auf Deutsch nehmen. So, Sie können entweder auf Englisch oder Deutsch Ihre Frage stellen. Ja. Und wenn ich nicht ganz verstehe, meine Freund wird übersetzen für mich. Bitte. So, we need... Uh, okay. Well, first of all, thank you for your inspiring talk. I have um, one question. Um, I'm not sure whether you're familiar with the books uh, Factfulness by Hans Rosling and Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker. I don't know. Well, the main thesis is that like on any measure, um, human flour flourishing uh, increased uh, in the past decades dramatically, um, despite like all the news uh, portraying it as, as like a decline or um, getting worse. So what what would you say to the thesis that like um, in terms of um, health, wealth, um, birth rates and um, well overall human flourishing, um, everything is getting better at the moment. So, the, so if I understand your question, the book says everything is getting better and what do I say? Remember my story about the guy who jumps off the building? When he passes the 10th floor, everything is getting better for him. Just because historically things have, for some people, gotten better, doesn't mean that that's the future. Um, also, in my, I haven't read this book, but I've read similar books. And in my experience, the The, uh, the, the analysis comes from very careful selection of numbers. I, I give you an example. There's uh, a common criticism which says, well, the amount of forest cover, the amount of land covered by forests is actually increasing now. Therefore, we don't have problems with deforestation. But you see, this is mixing up two different uh, things. The definition of forest cover is one thing, and the quality of the timber and the uh, diversity of the ecosystem is very different. So we are simplifying the forests, turning them into mass production uh, devices, depleting uh, the nutrients, but at the moment, the forest cover uh, is going up. So, <clears throat> uh, so I mean, I, 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 as I said, I didn't read the book, so I can't uh, make a precise criticism, but I would say, dig down into the, the data and maybe ask somebody who has a different point of view to go through and, and, and try to understand. In many ways, things have gotten better, although uh, the numbers used to prove that are so-called average numbers. Because so many Chinese have become much richer over the last 10 or 15 years, it's brought the global average up amazingly. This doesn't do much good for the poor Indians, uh, for example. I mean, the suicide rate in India is going up. That probably isn't in the book. Um, so th those are my thoughts about it. Hello. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, or I was wondering what your opinion is on that. Um, since the population is constantly growing and with the... Could please speak just a little bit louder. Yeah. Okay. Since the population is constantly growing and also the consumption that with growing population will appear, um, do you think there is a way to work around this without an, a decrease in population overall? <laughs> yes. The answer is yes. So, you want me to that elaborate? Would be cool, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, one uh, typical question in this debate how many people can be supported on the earth? You know, it's an interesting question. Uh, but it uh, misses the point. You know, the point isn't to maximize the number of bodies on this earth. 
I guess the point would be to have a healthy, happy, peaceful, materially well-fed uh, population, uh, which participates in a liberal uh, economic and political system. That, that's my goal. Uh, so how many people could you have on the planet with a high material standard of living and relative freedom and so forth? I, I mentioned already at the beginning of my speech, I don't know, but one billion, two billion, maybe. If you would like to put a lot of people together in a small space and just feed them the absolute minimum amount of food, meanwhile having a few percent very rich living off in a beautiful situation, I think you could have maybe seven or eight billion sustainably, I mean forever. Wouldn't be a very attractive uh, world for me, but I mean, it's, it's possible. Um, unfortunately, the world is moving in the second direction. It's not moving in the first. I think, so th this is a, a, uh, an issue which is very poorly understood. Um, we have only a few ecological uh, metaphors to help us think about this. Um, there's a famous example. There was an island which didn't have any animals on it, and they brought in deer for some purpose during the Second World War, uh, <clears throat> and, but they killed all the wolves uh, on the island, and so the deer were able to, you know, to, uh, to reproduce. And they actually, the population got very high, but they were totally miserable, and then it collapsed. Uh, I think the global population in 2050 will be lower than it is today. That's my guess. There are two ways for the population to come down. You can increase the death rate or you can uh, lower the birth rate. I mean, those are, given that we don't have planetary migration, the only two ways there is population is going to change is by births and deaths. Uh, the planet tends to work on the death side and the more attractive options for us are on the birth side. Um, birth control and uh, norms about family size and so forth. Um, just parenthetically, let me note, in our model, we found that birth control effectiveness uh, actually didn't have much impact. Uh, in one way or another, most people in the world do manage to have the number of kids that they want to have. Uh, the, sometimes the mechanisms are very poor ones, but, but the technology is, is there. The most effective thing in our model to reduce population was the so-called family size norms. What, what are the number of kids which normally the society considers to be an appropriate number? In some societies, it used to be five or six. In other societies, it's um, one or two, something like that. Um, and, uh, but for a variety of political reasons, we have tended to put birth intervention off the table. Uh, and that means we're left with the other side of the equation. I, um, so I haven't answered your question exactly because we don't, you know, we don't know the answer to it. I mean, some people have done cal theoretical calculations that give you 20, 30, 50 billion people. Uh, I, I don't, I think those are mathematical uh, games. They don't have any real consequence. You know, <clears throat> we, we say in theory, uh, theory and practice are the same. But in practice, there's an enormous difference between theory and practice. And I think that's the case with the population. In theory, we might be able to have 15 or 20 billion, but in practice, I think uh, by the end of the century, it will be back down in two, four, five billion, something like that. Um, you said for a new study starting today, you would account also the... the so I'm... Um, uh, yeah, it's, please, just because of the noise, I'm having... So say it again, please. Um, for a new study starting today, you would account the output in the military or the, the spendings in the military. Um, what do you think is the situation today and what exactly you would observe? So, <clears throat> I have to say, one thing I learned... <clears throat> 
Building a global model doesn't mean you know a lot about everything. Uh, I don't know very much about the military. I, I don't. I just see that functionally, all the money which is spent on aircraft carriers and jet fighters and guns and so forth would be much more beneficial to people if it was used for food production and housing and so forth. I mean, that's a fairly simplistic idea. Uh, I don't have precise numbers, and I certainly don't have precise recommendations. Um, I, it's an interesting issue now in the relationship between the United States and Europe, of course, over the discussions about NATO and you should spend more, et cetera. Uh, th uh, th this argument is based uh, on a view of the world which is looking back you know, in the, in the 50s. It's, it's not a view of the world which we need to have in order to develop a sustainable society. So uh, <clears throat> I would, instead of saying, you know, how much should we spend on the military and then what's left for something else, I'd do it the other way around. I'd say, how much do we need to solve our basic problems? And then if that leaves something for the military, well, OK, but uh, hope it doesn't. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so two hello. more questions, please. Uh, what's the secret to make people happy on the long term? Say that again. What's the secret to make people happy on a long term? To make people happy. On a long term, yes. <clears throat> Not just now and yeah. now. Well, <laughs> I could teach a whole college course on that question. It's an interesting question. Um, I just will say a couple things about it. Probably I don't answer your question. So first thing to know, most people who are alive today aren't going to be happy in the long term. I mean, we are coming into a period of severe stress. And people will be unhappy about that. So that's one thing. What is happy anyway? I mean, uh, you know, there are global happiness surveys. So they ask this question, what, what does it mean to be happy? Uh, we know two things about that I think are interesting. You are happy, generally, in comparison with your neighbors, not according to some absolute. If you have more than your neighbors do, you tend to be happy. If you have less than your neighbors do, you tend to be unhappy. And the problem is that we have brought, with television, we've made you know, <coughs> German and American TV stars into the neighbors of poor Indians and Indonesians and Filipinos. So they now have a different reference group. Uh, but it's, it's not an absolute standard. And of course, happiness uh, is defined differently in different societies. Uh, you, uh, okay, one more comment about this. Happiness is getting what you want, I guess. I mean, that's the definition, uh, my definition. So if you aren't getting what you want, you're unhappy. And if you want to get what you want, you have two choices. You can get more or you can want less. Those are the two possibilities. I think we will be more successful if we work on the second one. Okay. Um, I already have a microphone. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Meadows. Um, I have a question um, about the digitalization 4.0. Um, we talk a lot about um, the IT sector and the digitalization today. And you already said um, that if we spend too much hope on technology, it might be a little bad. And I, my question is, uh, do we even have the resources to make Uh, the IT in a sustainable way. I mean, you, you need to know uh, servers need resources, a lot of uh, materials there that are today even um, rare. So um, what is your, your opinion about that? Is it bad to um, spend such a hope in the IT sector? Thank you. Let me I tell you what I understood. And if I didn't understand correctly, you can ask me. What does it take to be sustainable? No, I mean. Is it wise 
that we spend so much hope in the IT sector, IT, oh. yeah? Because it, it needs a lot of resources and our recycling today is not in yeah. a very good way. And I also want to know about, um, do you have uh, um, a lot of data um, about how many resources are left to build our IT equipment? I, uh, <clears throat> at one time in my life, I worked as a consultant to uh, Bell Telephone Company, which at that time was the monopoly for the telephone system in the United States. So we, the IT was more primitive than today, but at, at least I had some contact with it. I think we love IT. Uh, one reason is that it makes great progress without worrying so much about all the political and social difficulties. You know, you, you can invent something and then put it into a product and sell it to consumers. And so we are seeing uh, enormous progress on IT where we don't see any progress on the, the gap between the rich and the poor or uh, protecting against global epidemic and so forth. We, so we, we, we like it because it's one area where we have seen relative success. It does, for, for sure, pose interesting natural resource issues. I mean, uh, lithium batteries are putting pressure on the lithium supply, and not only on the input side, but on the recycling side. I look out at all of these photovoltaic panels in Germany, and I'm enormously impressed. But it's the question, what are you going to do with them when they reach the end of their useful lifetime? You know. Uh, it used to be that there was an incentive to recycle photovoltaic panels because they had a lot of silver in them. But the economic and technological progress is reducing the amount of silver since it's very expensive. And, but the result is it's going to be much less interesting to recycle these things. So we have to worry about that. But I can tell you, I don't think that's going to become a serious problem. I think the energy and the climate issues which I discussed are going to affect society long before they have to start worrying really seriously about the uh, environmental or the resource consequences of IT. Uh, IT can be an enormously powerful tool, but not if unless we focus on our values and our cultural norms. Uh, you know, Facebook was a fantastic revolution. But now we see that it has very, very serious negative consequences, uh, not because of the technology itself, but because of the way, uh, the motivations of the people who are trying to make money from it. Um, I, uh, I'm personally thankful for IT. I, the first world model uh, was done on a typewriter. And I had to take a deck of punched computer cards down to the central campus every night and give them over. And in the morning, I would come back, and there would be a big stack of paper. And if I made one punching mistake, everything was wasted, and I had to start over again. Now, of course, on my laptop, I can uh, do computer runs uh, before coming over here tonight. So I personally, I like IT. Uh, but it's not, it's not going to solve our basic problems. The basic problems lie in other sectors. I'm not worried about the resources side so much. I think uh, the technology can bring, can bring along uh, rare earths, lithium, these things. We will find solutions. Uh, the environmental impact, the disposal side, that's a more interesting uh, problem. I, we haven't yet had much practice uh, with that. But I don't think we're going to get there. As I said, I think climate and energy will affect us first. So I, be, I'm going to take one more question, and then I'm going to give you all the opportunity to go do something more interesting. <laughs> yeah. so. So, so now I have the, the very bad situation <laughs> to, choose, to choose among the, the last questions. So who are the ones that want to so, ask a question? He, he wants to ask a question. He wants, so and, you, and you he want wants him, right, yes. All right, uh, thank you for the opportunity, and sorry for everybody else. Um, well, so for 
any of the of these scenarios, um, basically we have to change a lot uh, how we how we govern our everyday lives, right? Either we magically find a way to adapt society's growth, or we will have to adapt to the consequences. And I know that um, the word promising is a very difficult word for somebody who forecasts or tries to build models about the future, but I. <laughs> I just find it very difficult to find, um, well, promising ideas how to how to structure future life, be it political, be it in an economic way, be it in how we build our communities. Um, so maybe you don't have a promising idea or author or book, but maybe something interesting that you found or, or something that surprised you and maybe something that you find, um, well, worth considering for everybody here in the audience. So if you find that book, then you should tell me. <laughs> I, I tell you my own personal ideas about this. I have for 50 years been living with this idea that there's big problems coming and we need to, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> First of all, I think it's useful to separate problems into two different categories. I call them global problems and universal problems. Both affect everybody. So uh, water pollution, deforestation, nuclear proliferation, these are affecting everybody in the world. But some of these problems are universal, it means that local people can take local action and get local benefits relatively soon without waiting for people someplace else. So you in Ulm can reduce the noise in the city center or the air pollution or the water pollution here and immediately you get the benefits. You don't have to wait for people in Turkey or China to, to do it. Those are universal problems. And so one thing is to Pick a universal problem and work on it, even part-time. You, you will make a big impact, I prob you, probably you will, and you can get very satisfied about that. Then there are global problems, like you know, climate change. There is no way that in Ulm you can solve climate change. You need also the participation of the Chinese and, and so forth. So don't, personally don't spend too much time on the global problems. Then the second thing is to realize that any of these problems, even the universal ones, lie outside our personal power. We don't, any of us, have the possibility to do something that's going to solve one of these problems. But we do have the power to live a life which, if everybody else lived it, would eliminate the problem. And I think that's the ethical obligation of somebody today. Understand what is a lifestyle that could be afforded by everybody, and then take it for yourself, realizing others are not going to at first. Uh, but we know that the demonstration effect is very important. And we also know that as the crisis begins to rise, small islands of stability have enormous potential for stabilizing the overall system. And you can be contributing to that. So that's all I know. <laughs>